the resurgence of celluloid in movies, glass plates to replace hard drives, Instagram a money-making machine for Facebook, and Micro Four Thirds, is it still alive? Apparently so. And Wilson Webb as Photographer of the Week on this episode of Takis Take. Thanks so much for tuning in for another episode of Photography Radio. My name is Tomasz, and today you are listening to Takes Take with Take Kayo, where he covers what's new and interesting in the world of photography, including digital, analog, mobile, and everything in between. Enjoy. Can you imagine your life without photography? No? Then you will love this show. And it doesn't matter if you're a DSLR, a mirrorless, or a mobile phone shooter. We're here to help your photography grow. This is Photography Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Takez Take, which is my take on photography news this week. So let's begin now. We've talked about this before, and you all know how much I enjoy using film as well as digital in my photographic workflow. And we've seen this believe in film and film is not dead hashtag used on various social media platforms. But we're also seeing a resurgence of the use of celluloid or cinematic film in mainstream Hollywood movies. For instance, the latest Star Wars movie, The Rise of Skywalker, Ad Astra with Brad Pitt, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood all shot the old school way on celluloid. This week, I thought I would mention two more movies, Uncut Gems and Little Woman. When the decision is made to use celluloid over digital, directors and producers usually have to convince the studio why. Because of this careful thought process of choosing this particular medium, those that are responsible for shooting these movies often enjoy sharing not just why they use celluloid, but the entire thought process of making the movie in general. Now, I find this behind-the-scenes look of how a movie is constructed visually is rarely shared when it's shot digitally. Maybe it's because it seems too technical. But I think all of us as photographers, both film and digital photographers, can gain much insight when cinematographers talk about their creative process. Now, I'll leave the link in the show notes, but uh, on Kodak.com, uh, uh, they talk about the making of the movie Uncut Gems, and the DP, Darius Kanji, I hope that's how it's pronounced, walks us through the process of making the movie from the principal photography to their 29-day production days. Darius also talks about lens choice, aspect ratio choice, and most importantly for me, film choice, which is Kodak Vision 3 500T color negative film 5219, which is what CineStill 800T is based on, one of my favorite color negative films. His reasons for choosing this film, Darius Konji says, I decided to keep things as simple as possible by using just one stock. The 500T is great as you can use it for everything, from the brightest moments on a day exterior to the darkest moments on nighttime interiors, and have a consistent look through the overall production. Asked from an aesthetic standpoint why he chose film, again Konji says, I don't like the image tone too clean, as it just does not serve the purpose of storytelling. We all wanted texture from the grain. Now moving on to critically acclaimed movie Little Woman, directed by Greta Gerwig. This production went beyond just shooting on celluloid, but the principal photographer, Wilson Webb, decided to shoot portraits of all of the lead characters with traditional web plate photography, which is a process where your film is also your final print, which happens to be a piece of thin metal, as also known as tintype photography. Using a 130-year-old Dahlmeyer lens on a 8x10 large format camera, as well as a 25,000 watt second flash, and the exposures were up to 30 seconds long. Now, I'll leave a link as well in the show notes that uh, go through the process of taking these tintype photographs. Moreover, as visual artists, including cinematographers, 
we use whatever tools necessary to get our vision on some form of media, whether it's a digital memory card or celluloid or tintype. But as we can see in the world of movie making, where the stakes are very high when it comes to a successful or a failed project from a financial perspective, you can see more and more visual artists are choosing to use celluloid as the medium of choice to help them to tell their visual stories. Staying on the subject of various mediums to record or archive information, including images, the use of either spinning hard drives or solid state hard drives seems like a very stable platform, but all digital storage will fail at some point. And I'm sure most of us have experienced this, whether it's a corrupt media card, a spinning hard drive that stops spinning, or an SSD drive that just stops writing. For now, businesses and institutions that need long-term digital data storage have been creating backups or using RAI technology as short-term solutions. But Microsoft has ambitious plans of creating a glass plate digital media storage technology called Project Silica that can potentially store digital information without corruption for up to 10,000 years. Now, this is a quote from Microsoft's website. Project Silica is developing the first ever storage technology designed and built from the media up for the cloud. We are leveraging recent discoveries in ultra-fast laser optics to store data in quartz glass by using femtosecond lasers and building a completely new storage system designed from scratch around this technology. This opens up an incredibly exciting opportunity to challenge and completely rethink traditional storage system design and to co-design the future hardware and software infrastructure for the cloud. Now to show what this technology can do, Microsoft partnered with Warner Brothers and stored the original 1978 movie Superman on a piece of glass about the size of a baseball card, 7.5 centimeters by 7.5 centimeters by two millimeters thick, which equals 75.6 gigabytes of data. This piece of glass is impervious uh, of being corrupted by boiling water, baked in an oven or a microwave. It can't be demagnetized or other environmental threats that can affect traditional storage mediums. Now, I'll leave uh, links down below in the show notes, as well as a, a really uh, a link to a really interesting YouTube video that talks about how this technology will eventually be the future of long-term storage for historical and sensitive information that needs to survive for thousands of years. So imagine a future, perhaps in the near future, where we're able to store digital information on pieces of glass using maybe handheld lasers that we can buy from Best Buy or Amazon. Now, wouldn't that be amazing? As photographers, animators, or just digital content creators, many of us may lament how Instagram has changed over the years. Since Facebook bought Instagram back in 2012 for $1 billion, which seems like an insane amount of money to pay for an app that didn't have a clear monetization model. Eight years later, we can see how Facebook has integrated ads on the most popular photo sharing platform. And according to Bloomberg Business, the $1 billion investment is paying back at least 20 fold. According to insider information from Bloomberg, Instagram's total ad revenue from 2019 was $20 billion, a quarter of Facebook's total ad revenue for that year. Now, just as a comparison, YouTube's ad revenue for 2019 was just over $15 billion. And remember, YouTube shares their profits from that revenue with their content creators. Instagram does not. If these numbers are real, first of all, that is a lot of revenue. Second, if Facebook is creating this much revenue from this platform, like YouTube, I think there should be financial compensation for content creators who help generate this much income for Facebook. This may be one of the reasons why many power users on Instagram, aka influencers, have to use outside sponsors to try to make a living to generate income for themselves. And at the same time, it's something that Instagram appears to be trying to curb, claiming that it makes uh, the platform and these accounts less transparent. Or in the least, 
create contests, I think, and pay artists that are featured on Instagram's main account and perhaps have monthly features to charities that they donate to. More evidence that Facebook is not reinvesting back into the platform is when CEO of Instagram, Adam Mosseri, in a recent post on Instagram, claimed that the reason why there is no Instagram for iPad was because he lacked resources, if you can believe that. Now, if a company like Facebook only uses Instagram as a vehicle to generate profit without ever giving back to the company itself, as well as those who helped make the platform successful, I think many will gladly jump ship when a competing platform comes around to usurp Instagram and become the new leading social media photo and video sharing platform. Twitch or TikTok, anyone? Last week, I talked about the possible end of the Micro Four Thirds platform, and the evidence seemed pretty clear with Panasonic joining the Leica L Mount Alliance and Olympus's recent flagship, the OMD EM1 Mark III's lukewarm reception due to mediocre specs on their flagship. However, there has been some news that appears to point in the other direction. A report out of Japan says that in 2019, the Micro Four Thirds system took number one spot in market share with 19.8% of all digital interchangeable lens cameras sold in Japan in 2019. So that is very surprising for many of us here in North America or in Europe, but I found over the years that the Japanese market is not always the best indicator Uh, of global trends. Japan makes way more money selling to the US and the European market versus their own domestic market, and the domestic market tends to be a bit quirky or odd. Now, I know for a fact that small, compact, and as I mentioned, quirky cameras sell well in Japan, as well as in much of South Asia, even though the sales of these cameras may be duds in the rest of the world. As an example, the Nikon 1 and the Pentax Q system sold very well in Japan, but that trend didn't really uh, sit well with the rest of the world, did it? However, it is interesting to see that Micro Four Thirds is not only doing well in Japan, but it is a number one uh, platform in Japan. And again, I'm not surprised in the sense that small and compact and sometimes quirky cameras do very well in the domestic market. But another piece of news that made me think about the popularity of the Micro Four Thirds system, and something maybe I'm missing here, is that both Olympus and Panasonic made a joint media announcement recently that Yong Yu, Media Edge, and Venus Optics are all joining the Micro Four Thirds Systems Standard Group, which means they'll, that there will be developing products such as lenses, camera lights, and other accessories specific for the Micro Four Thirds system, which is great for those that currently are invested in the Micro Four Thirds cameras. Finally, on the same day that they made this announcement, Cosina Japan just announced the new Voigtlander Nocton 60mm f.95 lens, which has a 120mm equivalent in 35mm, a very high-performance lens. So perhaps I have to eat my words from last week about the end of Micro Four Thirds, that perhaps there is a future for this smaller uh, format and platform, which really is a good thing. I've always said that competition is good, including competing formats. However, my point from last week still stands true that Sony really needs to update that old 20 megapixel sensor with something more modern, like backside illuminated uh, CMOS sensor with phase detect autofocus across the entire surface and perhaps an upgrade up to 24 megapixels. My pick for photographer of the week is previously mentioned Wilson Webb. Now, we've already talked about Webb's work on the movie Little Woman as the on-set photographer, as well as shooting these wet plates for the actors. He also worked on other notable movies such as Marriage Story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Zoolander 2, and Men in Black 3. He started his career in the movie industry, so he's an on-set photographer as well as a DP or director of photography and camera operator. 
He's also both a digital and film photographer, with his digital gear being his Nikon Z7, D850, and D5 for his on-set photography, but he mentions that he also carries around his film cameras as well, including his Hasselblad X-Pan and Mamiya 7 Mark II, and likes shooting Ilford's HP5, FP4, and Delta Films. You can see some of uh, these film images on his Instagram account at Wilson Webb, which is double B, as well as his wet plate work for Little Woman. I also found a great interview with Wilson at Emulsive.org where he talks about his onset photography, his recent projects, his gear choices, and a really great question from M. He asked, who would you choose to take a portrait of in a one-hour portrait session, dead or alive? Webb's two choices are very cool, but you'll have to check out the article to find the answer. Thanks again for joining me for episode number 8 for 2020 on Take's Take, which is my take on photography news this week. I'd love to hear from you. Let us know how you're enjoying this format in covering photography news and if there's something you'd want to hear. So leave me a message at photographyradio.com forward slash take, which is spelt like take, but not pronounced that way. Again, that's photographyradio.com forward slash take. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll talk to you all next week. And until then, happy shooting. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Hit subscribe on your podcast app. It would mean a lot for us to have you as our regular listener. Head over to photographyradio.com to drop your suggestion for future editions of Photography Radio or simply to say hello. We would absolutely love to hear from you. In the meantime, have a wonderful night and we will be back with more photography in your ears very soon.